ch I'm going to take a chance here and see if you'll let me hold on. <laughs> Look at that, you guys. <laughs> Heavenly Father, today, we thank you for this day and for your amazing love. Thank you for having your hand on Rowan in the womb. You were shaping and forming him, designing a plan for his life. And so today, now, Mom and Dad have gathered here to dedicate him to you, God. And so they give him to you this day that your hand would be upon his life, that your will would be done in his life, and that he would faithfully follow you all the days of his life. So we just pray your protection upon him, your hand be upon him, and mom and dad and all those who have influence in his life, that they would be good, that you would protect him from the evil one, and Lord, that you would be glorified in all that he does. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right. Look at that. So we, ha we have a Bible uh, for him, as well as a certificate. So oh, God bless you guys. You. Appreciate you all so much. Good morning, church. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Do we need to try again? He is risen. He is risen indeed. We don't do it enough, but we definitely need to do it on Easter. Remind ourselves uh, of what he's done for us. And today is the day uh, in, in the weekend in which we celebrate the fact that he is risen. He's no longer in that grave. And I will have you guys to stand with us this morning as we sing, I am free. I am free to run. I am free to run. And I am free to dance. To the sun sets free, who the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. Yes, to the sun sets free, who the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. Who the sun sets free. 
Always free Scripture we're reading today is from Isaiah 53, 3, and 5 through 6. You might want to note that because it's, it's a doozy and we need to remember. No, no, I might not even get through it. Jesus was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid him, laid on him the sins of all of us. And bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul. Yeah. 
end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise
the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Please remain standing for prayer. blanket in the crowd. It's for Sandy Taylor, Chuck Fox's sister. Let's can gather around there. I think Julie has the blanket. And we'll pray together. Bow with me, Father, once again. We are so, so thankful this morning for your goodness, your mercy, your many blessings as we think over the past days and weeks and the year how good you've been to us and we're so thankful for each one lord who has gathered this morning to celebrate to celebrate the fact that we serve a risen christ one who's alive and who is there and who hears our prayer and who answers us on this day we come to you this morning lord humbly as always thankfully as always we think about this blanket that's for this lady we don't know her problems but we're so glad lord that you do and we just pray especially for her this morning that she may feel your healing touch that she may feel the comfort of the presence of your Holy Spirit, that she may know that you care for her and you love her, and that there are people who care and who are praying for her this morning, and that this blanket may give her comfort and remind her of a God who loves her. We think of the world around us, Lord, and the things that are happening. And sometimes we don't understand, but we do believe, Lord, that you are in charge. And so we trust you this morning. We trust you to undertake in national problems and local problems and world problems because this is your world and these are your people that you created and you love them and so we trust you to undertake this morning we pray for healing for those who are sick we pray for comfort for those who are distressed we pray for your holy spirit to draw near and to lead to you those who need to acknowledge you as their savior we just ask all these things this morning be with us as we worship this morning we know that your holy spirit is here and we know that each one who's here this morning will be strengthened and encouraged and challenged and will go forth from here more able and more encouraged to serve you. Bless Brother West as he preaches. Have your way, Lord, we pray in everything that's done in this service. And for all that's accomplished, we'll praise you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Forgot to thank the guys last week for making us that amazing breakfast. Uh, still enjoying the aromas of the bacon as it saturated our skin. Just such a good day it was, and so all the hard work that was put into that. Thank you for the guys that did that. Uh, and we have a new roof on the church. So praise the Lord that that was done, and um, we thank you for forgiving and supporting that <clears throat> and what a blessing it was that none of us guys had to get up on the roof this time so uh so thankful for that <clears throat> but you guys are just so generous and um just overwhelming so just thank you um there is no day more worthy of being celebrated than this day no day there is no day more important than today this is the day that can bring hope into the lives that need hope, peace into lives that are just in turmoil, love to lives that are missing love, and joy into lives that haven't rejoiced for a long time. And it's the day that can bring purpose to a drifting life. Nobody is here by accident today. 
I thank you for listening and being here. And you may think, oh, well, you know, I just decided to come. And well, God decided to call you to be here today as well. And so we are so glad that you are here. But today is also a day for those who, who to con- confess Jesus as their Lord and they can repent of their sins and become a new believer in Christ Jesus. To accept what Jesus did for us on the cross is such an amazing thing. And so we hope that as each person leaves this building today, that that's where you will be. You will have accepted what Christ did for you. I remember as a kid growing up, not that long ago. (laughs) Hey, that ain't that funny. No. (laughs) But I remember as a kid growing up and... And our parents, uh, my parents, uh, would get each of us kids an Easter basket for, for Easter. And so that was just always a big deal. And, but that basket would be hidden. So we would have to find the Easter basket. And so that was just part of the, you know, part of the fun. And well, we lived on 40 acres, so it could take a while. Probably a long enough time that mom and dad forgot to get the basket. It was days later, and they were able to sneak to the store, get the 50% discount, and come back, and you know, had the best. <laughs> no, it was never really that bad. But, but they would hide the, our Easter baskets, and we would have to go and find, and find them. So a big part of the fun was looking for those baskets. I mean, that was just, you know, that was part of the thrill. Maybe I gave some of you a night. Some of you have done that, and some of you were just like, oh, I've never heard of that. I'm going to do that next year. And you will forget. <clears throat> But it was a lot of fun looking for our baskets, and we knew that there was a big chocolate bunny waiting for us in those baskets. And so it was a a dilemma every year. It's like, do I want the solid chocolate bunny because there's more chocolate, or do I want the hollow chocolate bunny because it just usually had a little better better flavor? So it was, 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 uh, you know, anybody else, did you struggle with that? Yeah, some of you struggled with that too. Hollow, solid, you know, how many of you were solid chocolate bunny people? Okay, yep. yeah, they had good chocolate there. Okay, how about hollow chocolate people? Had hollow, ch- yeah, uh-huh, yep. Does he just kind of break it up and get a hold of it and stuff, you know? It's just, uh, but, but then it was gone oh so fast. But almost how much fun we had. But those baskets just didn't magically appear. If there are any children here today, there really is no Easter bunny that would deliver those baskets. So if, if, I, if I've ruined it for you, please forgive me. But that was our parents. They were doing that. And sometime in the early morning hours when it was still dark, my mom and dad would get up and they would hide those baskets. Often we don't think that anything good can, is happening in the dark, right? But God is always working even in the dark times of our lives. One guy said, when I was younger, I was afraid of the dark. Now that I'm older and I see the electric bills, I'm afraid of the light. <laughs> there was a little boy one day, he had gotten the broom and he'd gone out in, in the yard and played. He used the broom as a horse. And I don't know if you ever used the broom of a horse, but I did. A lot of us did, you know. And so I rode my horse on the broom and he did the same thing and played all day. Well, then he left the broom out on the front porch or on the back porch, I'm sorry. And so that evening after dinner, Mom was cleaning up, and so Mom said, hey, would you go out on the back porch and bring the broom in here? And the little boy turned to his mom and said, Mom, uh, he said, I don't, I don't want to go out there. It's, it's dark. And his mom smiled and said, it's okay, son. He said, you don't have to be afraid of the dark. She said that Jesus is out there, and he'll look after you, and he'll protect you. You don't have to worry about that. And the little boy looked at his mom with a confused little kind of stare on his look and said, are you sure that Jesus is out there? And she said, yes, he's everywhere. Jesus is everywhere and he's always ready to help you when you need him. So the little boy thought about that for a minute. And so he went to the back door and he cracked it open and looking out into the darkness, he called, Jesus, if you're out there, would you hand me the broom? It's just hard to imagine that there can be some good things that come out of the dark times of our lives, right? While God doesn't bring the dark times on us, he can still use those times for our good. Satan very definitely uses the dark times against us, and he tries to get us to to doubt God whenever we're going through those dark times. And so he's beating us over the head with those things, and he tries to get us to doubt the God who created us, the God who loved us. 
who cares for us. The one who was the cause of our pain is the one who convinces us to blame God instead. I'll be so glad when people start blaming Satan and quit blaming God for things, you know? But God is always the first one to get the blame, isn't he? But God is never the one who did it. God is never the one who caused it. It was the serpent that tempted Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden. It was Adam and Eve who ate the fruit of the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden, despite the fact that God specifically told them, do not eat the fruit on that tree. Don't eat that fruit on that tree, he said, or otherwise you will die. God tried to prevent pain and suffering, but Adam and Eve chose disobedience and death instead. And the reason that you have skin cancer is because of the choice they made that day. The reason that you have a, a bad leg is the, is the bad choices they made that day. The reason that you can't see as well as you used to is because of the bad choices they made that day. You lost parents. You maybe lost a child because of the bad choices they made that day. Sin entered the world. Death entered the world. God did not do that. Man did it. And we can blame Adam and Eve all that we want, but I do not think we would have made a better choice. When people say, well, <clears throat> I say all that to say this, that God is not the one who brings the darkness into our lives. Could he prevent the bad things that, that happens? Absolutely, yes. Why doesn't he pre prevent the bad things from happening? And who is to say he hasn't already done that? How many times has God had his hand on your life? How many times has he spared you and protected you that you were completely unaware of it? But God was faithful and kind. Maybe you had a praying parent or a grandparent or somebody six generations before you that prayed. And God protected you. Sin brought darkness into the lives of every human being who's ever lived. But God provided a remedy for the darkness. He sent the light of the world, Jesus, into the world to conquer the darkness. John chapter 8, verse 12 says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Isn't it great that you don't have to walk in darkness? How many times do we just leave the light off in the house and just walk through the house thinking, I know where I'm going, and we do know where we're going. The problem is we don't see what the kid left in the floor. <laughs> so spend the extra penny, turn the light on, and make your way there safely. Jesus is the light of the world. He's available to us, just like flipping on the light switch in, in our homes. He's available if we receive him. We don't need to walk in the dark because we can walk with him, the light of the world, in our lives. John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 says, The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. The light of Jesus is brighter than anything, and darkness cannot overcome it. Darkness cannot be there when there is light. They don't coexist together. There's either one or the other. You can't walk with a little darkness and a little light all at the same time. We can turn out half the lights in the room, and still there's going to be light in the room. Easter, for us, is all about celebrating the living Jesus Easter morning for the disciples and those who had followed Jesus all over Israel. It all started with a sorrow and a grief that first Easter morning. For us, as we celebrate Easter today, we get to, and we got up here and we said, He is risen. And you said, He is risen indeed. Is risen indeed. And, you know, sometimes when we say that, maybe we could like have a little joy, you know, when we say that. <laughs> Because I'm sure sometimes when God hears that, he's like, uh, I think I would have just rather stayed in the grave. He has risen indeed, you know. Right? <laughs> but he's risen indeed. And so as we celebrate Easter today, we get to celebrate that, that Jesus is alive and he's well. And for many of us, he's living in our hearts and in our lives. 
But that first Easter morning, for the disciples and those who were following Jesus, they had followed him all over Israel. That first Easter started with sorrow and grief. We know the rest of the story. We know that Jesus did die on the cross, but we also know, we know that he rose from the dead. We know that death could not hold him. We know that the grave could not contain him. We know that the beating that he took could not break him. Jesus had a mission to accomplish, and there was nothing in this world or out of this world that was going to stop him from doing it. The work of redeeming us, our souls from our sins, And the body of death that encompassed us, that was his mission. To accomplish his mission, we had to be punished for our sins. We had to be punished for our sins, but God loved us. And and the required punishment for our sin was death. For all have sinned, it says in Romans chapter 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. How many people have sinned? All. All of us. There's not a person sitting here, I don't care how good you are, I don't care how kind you are, I don't care if you pull over and help strangers change a tire. All of us, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. There are not enough good works that you can do on this planet to deserve, to deserve being saved. And Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin. So we know all of sin, according to Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23 says, for, for the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. That's what I earned, my sin. That's the price I get. I, I, I go out and work a job. I get, I get a salary for that. I get some money for that. The sins that I committed, I get a salary for that too. And that salary is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Jesus, the sinless son of God, took our punishment. He was whipped beyond recognition as a human being. He was beaten. His blood was shed. The people, they spit on him and they mocked him. And they crucified him. They they hung him on a cross and drove nails through his hands and nails through his feet. They humiliated him. And he took our place. It should have been us being spit on. It should have been us being beaten. It should have been us being whipped. It should have been us being crucified. But it wasn't. It was Jesus. He took our place so we could be forgiven. But we can't leave it at just forgiven. Because God wanted so much more than just to forgive us. As we confess Jesus as our Savior, as we repent of our sins, we are forgiven. But God wanted us, his children, to be with him forever and ever someday. There is a heaven and there is a hell. Now, I know that there are churches that tell you that hell was just, that's just a story, but that's not a real place. But it is a real place. And Jesus taught and spoke about hell as much as he did about heaven. And so as we confess Jesus as our Savior and repent of our sins, God wants us not only just be forgiven, but that we would be with him forever someday. And that's why Jesus rose from the dead. That's why. See, the, him dying on the cross and shedding his blood, he took our punishment He died in our place, so that was our punishment for our sins, so now we can be forgiven. But what's the point of being forgiven if we don't have eternal life? And so God offered eternal life through us because Jesus just didn't die for us, but he arose from the dead for us as well, so that we could be with him forever. And that's why Jesus defeated death. John 20, now we get... Verse, starting in verse 1, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Mary had been possessed by many demons, by the way. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. This is John, okay, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. It was dark when Jesus arose from the dead. Anybody here? have it any harder than Jesus. We've been betrayed at times. We've suffered illnesses. 
Some have been abused and even beaten by others, but everyone here is still alive. Some of you just barely, but you're still alive. <laughs> this time was very dark for Jesus, as his disciples who would vow to die with him had run away from him. Satan was throwing everything he had at Jesus, trying to discourage him from his mission. Jesus understood the darkness that we go through because it was dark for him. You're not alone in your suffering. But even though it was dark, something great happened. The darkness would not overcome the light of the world, and Jesus would arise and be victorious over the rulers of darkness. Good things can happen. Jesus defeated the darkness. He defeated the rulers of darkness, the principalities. of the, He defeated all of those things. He conquered all of those things so that we could live in light. Good things can happen in the dark. Have you ever had an Indiana morel mushroom? Good things can happen in the dark. <laughs> Verse 3, Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb, and they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter. John outran Peter. He's not bragging, but, you know, I outran him. Uh, beat him. <laughs> beat him like a drum. And John, he stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. John finally went in and saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was still standing outside the tomb, crying as she wept. She stooped and looked in, and she saw two white-robed angels, one sitting on, at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. I wonder how many times we've done that too. Not recognize Jesus when he was standing right there. And he said, dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you've taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. This is the second time that Mary's been to the tomb this morning. She went there twice. She was the first one that saw and went and told. And then she comes back with John and Peter. Apparently, she followed them. Apparently, she wasn't as fast as John and Peter, but she made it there. And after they left, she looked inside the tomb again. Only this time, there are two angels. Only she didn't recognize them as angels. Grief distorts reality. When you're going through difficult things and ugly things in life, it distorts reality. It's hard to get a grasp of things that, that you know, things that, that, are, that are taking place. When you're in the middle of it, nothing else matters. Every day we run up and down this street. My wife and I do, and a lot of you do as well, or whatever street you may be on. But we're back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But when we have suffered a loss, and we're down there at Jewel Ritman in the funeral home, all of the people driving by don't matter anymore because of everything that's taken place inside that funeral home. The grief that we're experiencing, the loss that has come around us, all of the busyness and the hecticness and all the things of this world, all the money in this world doesn't matter anymore. Grief distorts reality and it has a way of blocking out all the good. You've been there. You can't see how God could work through the tragedy that you're going through. And then Mary runs into Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. She thought he was the gardener. Well, rightfully so. Jesus did create a garden one time in Eden, a really good one. I guess he's a pretty good gardener. Because Jesus, who, who he was and who he is, but yet at this moment, she still doesn't recognize him. And she asked Jesus, 
<laughs> where his body is. <laughs> He's like, uh, right here. Peter and John are now believing Jesus is raised from the dead. But Mary is still looking for dead Jesus. Where's his body? Tell me where he's at so I, I can go and take care of him. She's still looking for dead Jesus. Most people live and believe as though Jesus is dead. They believe that Jesus was a good person, but he was just a person in history who's now dead. The impact of Jesus on their life is no greater than Abraham Lincoln or Napoleon. They existed, but now they're dead. They believe he was good, but now he's dead. And they do not realize that they are the ones who are dead. Verse 16, Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and cried out, Rabbani, which in Hebrew means teacher. And Jesus said, don't cling to me, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go, to, go find my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary found joy that Jesus had risen from the dead. She was hoping that things would go on as before, but the old way was not the way forward. When Jesus would ascend to the Father, they could no longer cling to his physical body, and it wasn't going to be long before Jesus would ascend. But he would be with them in a new way instead. The Holy Spirit was going to come upon them, and every new follower of Jesus would have the presence of Christ in their lives through the Holy Spirit. But there's another really great thing. Jesus calls his disciples brothers. Sisters, they're part of his family. You're a part of his family. God the Father is, is now their father through the work that Jesus did on the cross and in the grave. But here's even more great news for you today. If you confess your sins to Jesus and repent of your sins, that means to turn from your sins and faithfully follow Jesus, then you too have a brother in Christ. You have a father who is the Lord God Almighty. <clears throat> On a wall <clears throat> near the main entrance to the Alamo in San Antonio, there's a portrait that hangs there on the wall close to the entrance. And there's an inscription there that says, James Butler Bonham, no picture of him exists. This portrait is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It is, pl it is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. No literal portrait of Jesus exists either, but the likeness of the son who makes us free can be seen in the lives of his true followers. In his sermon, The Writing on the Wall, <clears throat> William Williman he uh, tells a story uh, at an aggravating funeral at a country church. And I don't know if you've ever been to an aggravating funeral or for, before, but I have. <clears throat> so I just wanted to stand up and scream, right? But the preacher, he pounded on the pulpit, and he looked over at the casket, and he would say, It's too late for Joe. It's too late for Joe. He might have wanted to get his life together. He might have wanted to spend more time with his family. He might have wanted to do that, but he's dead now. Too late for him. <laughs> but it's not too late for you. There's still time for you. You can decide. You still are alive. It's not too late for you. Today's the day of the decision, the pastor would say. And then he told how a Greyhound bus had run into a funeral procession once on the way to the cemetery after they left the church. And he said, and that could happen today too. <laughs> today is the day to get your life together. Too less disgusting it was insensitive. Worst of all, it was also true. <laughs> While it was still dark, God did great things. Jesus was risen from the dead, especially in the darkness of our sins, 
God can do great things again if we invite him into our lives, if we confess and we repent of our sins and faithfully follow him. Today, I want to encourage you in that. Your faith, I don't know where you are. Maybe there's somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior. Today is the day of salvation. It might be too late for old Joe over here, but it's not too late for you. There is a day that is coming. The Bible says it is appointed for man once to die, and then the judgment. We will all be judged someday. Maybe you've accepted Christ as your Savior, but you really haven't been living for him. You just wanted enough of Jesus to go to heaven, and that's pretty much it. Well, there is no such thing. You're either living for Jesus or you're not. He either has all of you or he has none of you. He will not share you. God said, I'm a jealous God. I'm a jealous God. He's not going to share us with the things of the world and and with him as well. He couldn't do that even if he wanted. The scripture says he's holy, 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 which means he's pure, pure, pure. He can't be contaminated with the sin in our life and the filth in our life, and but yet still be buddy, buddy with him. That's not how that works. Jesus died not only so we could be forgiven of our sins, but so that he could conquer those sins in our lives, as those sins no, need, no longer need to conquer us, and that we can live for him. And so today I want to encourage you, if you are not living for Jesus, you can. We said he is risen and you said he is risen indeed. That means he's alive, he's living, and he's living in my life today. And many of you can testify to the fact of how he's living in yours. But maybe some of you, you're just not living for him. And so today is your day to give your life to Christ. Maybe just to repent of the behavior that you've had and you, you've just, you've slacked off in your life spiritually. You've not been the man of God that God has called you to be. God has called you to be the man of your household, to stand up and to lead the way to Christ. He wants you to lead your wife to Jesus. He wants you to lead your children to Jesus. And he's calling you to be the man. Your responsibility as a man is to do more than to make money. It's to live a godly life and to live it for him. And as you live your life for Christ, all those other things will find the exact right spot where they belong. with your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment, I want to invite you to ask Jesus to come into your life today. Maybe just to just recommit yourself to Christ and ask him to forgive you that that I've not been the person, I've not been the woman that I should be and, and I've not been really living for Jesus. I've been living more for my family or for my children. And I want to live for God first, above everything else. If that's you today, I want you to invite Jesus into your heart, into your life. I want you to make him the Lord of your life today. And you live for him. Father God, we thank you for this day. We live in awe of it. We live in awe of your love. While we chose death, you offered life. And you just didn't make somebody else to come and die for our sins. You did it yourself. And the word became flesh, it says in John, and dwelt among us, made his home among us. He had dirty feet and dirty hands and calluses. He was hurt and he cried at times and he laughed. But he lived here on this earth. You lived here on this earth so that you could take my punishment for my sin.
But not only that, but you conquered death. Nobody could rise from the dead on their own, but only through Christ. And God, so that we could have everlasting life with you someday. And so, Lord, I pray over your people now. I pray that they would know the God who is living, who loves them, who cares for them, who's provided a way of hope and has offered us the gift of eternal life through Jesus. So today, that person who may be praying, that maybe that dad, that mom, might be a child that's here today, but it's just praying, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. I haven't been living for you. I've taken you for granted. And today I make you Lord of my life. Lord, I'm gonna follow you and be faithful to follow you all the days of my life. I wanna seek after you and the things of God and the things of this life that really matter. And Lord, I wanna be a godly example to my wife, to my husband, to my children, to my family, to, to my neighbors. I want to be a godly example to the people I work with. And so, Father, I pray that for those right now who may be praying that prayer, that, God, that you are making new, a new life in them, a life committed to you, a life that wants to love you and serve you. Would you have your hand upon them? Would you protect them from the enemy that seeks to destroy them? And, God, would you help them to live true to the commitments that they make here today? May they live a life that honors you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just one more moment. I just want to be praying for you guys. But if that was you today, would you just raise your hands and pass to us? That was me. That was me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, you saw those hands. You saw the hearts and the brokenness. And God, I just pray that as they have prayed that prayer today, that you would encourage their hearts. As a body of believers now, we pray for them. We're going to lift them up and pray for them this week and going forward. We're going to pray over them. And Lord, we don't even know who they are, but you do. And so that's all we need to know. So God, would you help them and strengthen them this day in mighty ways. May they confess to others what's been going on in their lives. And may they share what it is that you have done with them and for them today with other people. Lord, we just thank you for the testimony that you give us, and may we share it boldly and proudly, the work that you are doing in us. God, we love you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for conquering our sin and conquering the death that would have us forever. We love you, God, and it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. You are dismissed.